nice uh, platforms we are like we are talking on zoom now yeah. i think you got to have you got to have huge uh, innovation happening here because they're going to make it almost real life i mean as if you are sitting across uh, in much more real and uh, much more friendly than what it is today and uh, mm. i think that's where the this thing is going to come i think with virtual headsets is what you mean right like when you wear it yeah yeah correct people are wearing it correct. it seems as if you are in the same room yes <clears throat> No, no, and also if you remember, I mean, uh, you may not this thing, but uh, when uh, the two thousand eight nine crisis happened, uh, Cisco came out with these virtual meeting rooms, uh, where you know they created the table in such a way that you were sitting like on a round table okay. with a person on the other end, and uh, almost real life situation. That was video conferencing. That was not. Uh, uh, that was a much more expensive, uh, very expensive actually. The entire. This is that telepresence. Yeah, Mr. telepresence. Politics. Right, you're right. Telepresence, and that became popular. Then many other versions came out, right? Of it, different yeah. came out, uh, and then Indians, you know, as usual, copied it and uh, brought out their own version. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I think that was it. And I, I can see this now moving maybe to that because, see, the one question we all have ourselves: you got a four hours meeting in London. Why would you fly down to London? Exactly. Can you do it through Zoom, Teams, whatever? In fact, I think a lot of government bodies, uh, what I hear is, ha- are recommending Cisco Webex. So I think the material I was talking to somebody from uh, the Material Recycling Association of India, and I think even when uh, Mr. Gadkari came online, I think he had given a few guidelines with a group of entrepreneurs saying that you have to use Cisco Webex. So I think even now, uh, maybe some preference on that for some functionality, or maybe I'm sure they are also onto it to launch something big now. Yeah, this is all the effort. Uh, uh, our friend uh, is Cisco ka chief ban ho gaya earlier. The, um, the CEO, global, global CEO, John Cham- Chambers. Chambers, Chambers. Chambers, yeah. All Chambers doesn't deal with companies; he deals with governments. <laughs> <laughs> he sells to governments. So whenever you listen to him, he says, "Oh, I spoke to Russian Prime Minister or Prime President. I spoke to Indian Prime Minister. I spoke to the U.S. President." So his discussions are at that level. <laughs> so he he wins these large government contracts, and uh, uh, obviously he's also part of the whole innovation. So, so there. So we just have one minute to go. Maybe at five. Okay. It's five. So we'll start, shall we? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Firstly, a happy World Environment Day to all of you. My name is Karan Thakkar, and I'm the founder of Treco, the recycling company. Thank you all for being here today. For years now, we have known that climate change is real, and the results can be quite devastating. The last decade, we witnessed maximum number of natural calamities. This year we have seen the worst side of nature when human intervention was at its peak and the best side of environment when the human intervention was least so this day becomes really important to reflect on the interconnectedness with nature as to where we are this world and environment day rather celebrating the fruits of nature we are worried as we are in the midst of earthquakes and cyclones somewhere we had also accepted and given up that nothing can change however in this lockdown we could see that by imposing some self restrictions there can be some positive in the environment sustainability 2.0 in times of covid 19 is a webinar series we have launched to start conversations and share insights with entrepreneurs and leaders about environment and sustainability how do we move forward from here is a big question mark hence in today's webinar reset restart and recycle we have the best of the best with us today a power packed panel of speakers Today we have a panel of thought leaders who have seen the length and breadth of corporations and seen many strategies and execution cycles that has shaped corporate India. Here's a small fun fact: Before I started my company, I worked at KPMG for three years, and this was the time when, while I was at the mines, I found my purpose to start a recycling company. And Richard was the head of the risk advisory vertical that time, so he's my boss's boss. He's actually my ex, he's my ex super boss. 
And having other leaders from Ernst and Young and McKinsey takes me back to the memory lane, and I'm very glad that we've got the best possible combination on this World Environment Day. All of our panelists' introduction can actually run into pages, and hence I'm sharing a very brief about all of them. Our first panelist, Mr. Richard Rekhi. Richard is presently a board member of KPMG Dubai. He is a former chief executive officer of KPMG in India, where he was a member of the global board and the council of KPMG International. With over 36 years plus experience in consulting and professional services, Richard has worked in Arthur Anderson, Ernst Young, and KPMG, where he has spearheaded the firm in various capacities. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Our second panelist, Mr. Anjani Agarwal. Anjani retired from ENY in June 2019 as global metals sector leader and global client service partner. 40 plus years of professional experience, 26 years as partner at EY, had set up the consulting practice for EY, worked across most business sectors. Welcome, Anjani. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Suvajoy Sain Gupta. Suvajoy is a partner, Gurgaon, and leads McKinsey India's power and renewable energy practice in India. He brings 26 years of experience in serving global energy companies across Europe, Middle East, and India. So, Vajoy also leads the firm's work with the central government working across multiple ministries such as those for railways, power, coal, and renewable energy. Welcome, Suva Joy. Thank you. So, my opening question to all of you is that the world around is changing so rapidly. What are the drivers for this change? And what impact does this have on environment? This, this question is for all of you. Anybody can go first. Yeah, Richard. <laughs> then, okay, you want me to go? Okay, fine. Uh, uh, thank you. And I would also like to uh, uh, supplement what you said. Wish everybody a World Environment Day. I don't think, Karan, you could have chosen a better day to hold this seminar, uh, this conference, and, uh, you know, get views around uh, the environment. And uh, also at a time when we are sitting in the COVID crisis. I think the important point is that uh, uh, this whole ESG debate that has been going on for a long time. And the one thing that I've noticed is that um, uh, any debate gains momentum in times of crisis. The adoption is much faster. And uh, the ESG debate has been going on for some time. And as uh, we all know that COVID has come and we are in the middle of COVID. In fact, uh, we are right in the middle of COVID. We don't know where it's going. We don't know whether we're in the middle, we are in the beginning, or we are where we are. But it is it is something that has come and hit a pandemic, which has hit the world after many, many years. More than 100 years back, we had something of this level of crisis. While for COVID, a vaccine is being built, I don't see that if this environment, we don't have a vaccine. So if the environment degrades, we have our own selves to blame. So I think the world has to, the impact of climate change is much slower than COVID. COVID has come and brought the economy to a uh, grinding halt. Uh, I'm not sure whether anybody's even done a calculation what the global economy has suffered in terms of financial loss across the world because of COVID and what will the total amount be. But you can see the reaction of all governments uh, which have happened uh, along the way. So, uh, so the current crisis can at least provide us us, that if we are not careful with the way we deal with environment, we're actually dealing with a very serious issue. And, uh, and the lessons, what we can get out of COVID are very profound. And it can help us in dealing with the environmental issues as we deal with it, uh, as we, uh, you know, come across it. Uh, you know, the important point that I want to put out here is that uh, last year, in 2018, the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, actually wrote a letter to all the CEOs of his investing companies and he told them that uh, he is going to look to invest in companies which actually follow the ESG. And that letter was pretty hard hitting and it was an opening eye opener for a lot of companies. And 2019, in my view, was the inflection point when we saw over $40 billion go into uh, ESG related companies. And 2020 was to be the shift of moving that yes, we trust ESG and if you are an ESG company, you would perform better than what other companies in a similar category would perform. So today what's happening is 
all the uh, uh, top executives, uh, in fact, we were discussing a little bit before, uh, because we don't have inclusive growth, uh, we have uh, the top executive pay has again come into scrutiny as to whether some people are being overpaid considering so much job layoffs have taken place. And also, uh, we are also seeing how, uh, uh, you know, governments and the uh, uh, NGOs and the other sectors are trying to work to deal with the situation which we have on hand. And um, we also need to understand how some of this that is going to impact us. And, you know, one no better example to give here than uh, Unilever. Uh, when Paul Polman actually came and joined Unilever, uh, he had one uh, intention in mind was, how does he make the company more environmental friendly and at the same time make profit? Paul Polman, when he first came in, uh, it, he was resisted. I mean, some of his moves did not work very well. Uh, I mean, the results were not there. In fact, the stock analysts didn't understand what he was doing and the stock market at that time actually fell. And uh, the, the company was also not doing very well financially in the beginning, but he persisted. And uh, he, in fact, uh, he was the one CEO who went back to his shareholders and said, I'm not going to give you quarterly results. And Wall Street, in a way, punished him for it because he said, I'm not looking for short term profits, but I'm looking for long term kind of gains. And he tried to build in a system in which he could bring a sustainable company up. And during his tenure as the CEO of Unilever, the share price more than doubled. And that is reflection as profit went up. He went in for new brands. He went and acquired brands which were more eco-friendly. He went into uh, encouraging his executives to think through usage of less water. Uh, you know, bring uh, you know, bringing back uh, health to the soil. I mean, various initiatives that Unilever took at that point of time and became what it became. So I think you know the advantage of that is there. Secondly, recently we have seen the European Commission come out with a regulation that they want to bring a low carbon economy and they are bringing what they call as uh, 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 stable financial system uh, where they are saying that uh, sustainable finance, that means they are going to fund those companies which are actually employing ESG into that. So capital flows are going to go into those companies which have sustainable investments. So we are finding regulatory also now trying to push this and uh, there is empirical evidence on the stock markets which are showing that similar kind of ESG companies. These are early days. Let me tell you, these are very, very early days. And ESG companies are performing better than their peers. And of course, these are all, uh, I mean, there's no 100% of this thing. But uh, for example, the Morningstar reported that 51 out of their 57 companies uh, showed better performance, outperformed their market competitors. Similarly, uh, MSCI had 15 out of the 17 companies actually uh, outperform. So I think there is also financial evidence that uh, it is there. So it is time for a reboot to company strategies to align your ascend incentives and create credentials and change the fiduciary responsibilities to encompass the environmental, social and governance uh, procedures that we have. So these are my opening remarks, uh, Karan. Great. I think uh, many will follow the Unilever example and uh, definitely the government's coming forward, uh, giving uh, these uh, financial stimulus packages to companies who can prove that they have done something for environment. Anjini, over to you. What would be your opening remark on this subject? What are the drivers of change? How does it impact the environment? Uh, thanks, Karan. And greetings to all on the World Environment Day. So let me set uh, the context uh, before COVID and when the COVID arrived. And if you look at the really the trends, mega trends, the what are relevant to today are uh, population, consumption, urbanization, and globalization. Now, despite having pulled millions out of uh, you know, extreme poverty, we are still in a world of social inequalities and finite resources and impending uh, really climate crisis. No, we are consuming beyond our means. You know, the humanity, uh, you know, there is something called the Earth Overshoot Day uh, when uh, we as humanity consume more than what we have recreated that year. And last year it was 29 July. And within uh, 20 years of uh, measurement, we have moved that up by two months. So we are, we, are, we are moving really, really at a faster pace. 
Um, we are in Asia, so Asia would uh, contribute maybe 50% of global GDP, uh, but also consume 40%. But what is relevant is really the middle class consumption, that would be 50% consumption in, within Asia. And with every consumption, there is waste. Uh, so, so we have to be mindful of that and uh, particularly solid waste. And uh, Asia, in terms of the global uh, goals, has been uh, regressing on uh, clean water, on decent work, and also on responsible consumption and production. So that's the bad news uh, that we're working on the consumption side. I look at the interplay between uh, what uh, population and environment. You know, since 2010. Hunger for commodities has uh, has eradicated 50 million hectares of uh, deforest, prime forest. And what it does, you know, deforestation really affects water security, biodiversity, uh, some of the large, uh, you know, emphatic uh, medicinal breakthroughs, loss of carbon sink for the world, uh, displaced tribes, and also dissatisfied farmers. And and the impact really is not linear. You know, we, we last five years were the warmest in history, with 2019 uh, peaking it with the highest, warmest year ever. And uh, in a couple of years back, as many as 18 million people were displaced by, by climate change. Uh, God knows what will be the impact this year. And the nexus between uh, really the, the water, the energy, the food, and, and the climate crisis is, is are more robust and more visible now, uh, and and uh, and we are more and more convinced that the planetary safety for humanity and the equity from a societal societal perspective are you know two parts of the same coin. I think Anjani is. Yeah. So, you know, taking the leap from what Anshi said, uh, moving on to Roger, I think that there is uh, data that maybe in the next, uh, say by 2050, there will be many communities that will be displaced either by rising water sea level or scarcity of drinking water. And and then, you know, the same thing, what are the drivers of change and uh, what impact does it have on the environment in today's crisis? Over to you, soldier. Yeah, thank you. I hope you can hear me. And uh, uh, again, greetings on World Environment Day uh, to everyone. Uh, I think, you know, this is one something that we've been talking about for a long time. But last year, as McKinsey, we published a report uh, on climate risk and response, which looked at the physical manifestation of climate risk uh, across different uh, parts of human activity. And the conclusions were quite stark. That, you know, we looked at it across uh, different uh, elements that the physical risk drivers like floods, droughts, heat waves, cold waves, wildfires, then something which takes a little bit more time, uh, temperature rises, precipitation, sea level rises. And then there, of course, there's the transition risk because in many of these cases, the solutions will take 30 to 50 years uh, often because up to 2030, we believe whatever uh, effects we will see up to 2030, that's almost locked in. Any actions we take will only have an impact beyond the 2030 uh, kind of time frame. Now, if we look at that from the perspective of how does the physical climate risk manifest itself, and our conclusions were that there were uh, uh, impacts, implications for livability and workability. For example, on the India side, we figured that the probability of lethal heat waves is going to go up more as we go along. As Anjani said, you know, last five years have been the hottest. Before this current uh, round of rain in Delhi, temperatures had reached 46 and 47 degrees in May, which, uh, you know, I've lived in Delhi for many years. It's usually in June or later that these kinds of heat waves uh, come. So we are seeing very different type of uh, profiles. We were talking to some of our uh, clients in the power generation, hydro power generation and metals uh, type of space. And they said that the kind of flooding we have seen in the last two to three uh, years, the level of flooding has gone up uh, substantially. So the physical manifestation of climate change is already being felt. It is upon us. 
uh, and it's going to have impact on the livability, workability, food systems, because where uh, in the, the cropping patterns and agriculture in different parts of the country, uh, parts of the world, because of precipitation and temperature changes is going to change. Physical assets, whether it is uh, housing or uh, supply chain, infrastructure assets, and then finally natural capital. These five areas we will see substantial impact. And we see actually just building on what Richard said earlier, uh, COVID and uh, uh, you know the large scale pandemic risk, as well as the climate uh, risk, we see some very clear similarities. So in the sense that these are systemic risks. So COVID, for example, created uh, uh, a reduction in transportation, which created a reduction in oil consumption. That created a huge impact in terms of uh, stock markets. So it's kind of a cascading systemic type of risk. Uh, other element of this is non-linear because you know this is does the, the risk and the impact does not increase linearly with the increase in the effect. Third is regressive that it actually disproportionately affects the lesser well-off populations, lesser well-off communities. So both climate risk we have seen as well as pandemic uh, is uh, similar to that. And finally, I think. Both, you know, while we like to think of them as black swan events, but a lot has been written about and well researched. So one can argue that both could have been, you know, foreseen and necessary actions could have been taken. Uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's possible to say that neither of them is a black swan uh, kind of event. However, the impact of a pandemic like COVID is much more immediate and therefore action uh, required is much more immediate. And we see another uh, similarity between the two in the sense that it requires each individual uh, country or company or community can do its own bit, but only Going forward, what do we see how this is going to uh, get affected? Points out many. I think the first is that, that the season uh, of this kind of a large Money availability should not be a problem. And the third is that, if, you know, at the end of the day, the consumer's uh, uh, voice speaks. And we are seeing that already in uh, Europe and parts of US where consumers are voting with their wallets for more mm. environmentally sustainable products, mm. whether it's in fashion or food or uh, other areas. Of course, it may take a bit more time for that kind of awareness and that kind of uh, consumers exercising their choice and preference to come to the more uh, emerging markets. But I think these three things give me some optimism that this is not going to get swept under the carpet. And I think also we have uh, to learn to le live with a new norm, which is being online now. That is another big shift. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but you know I was in fact like we were chatting just before the panel started that how we've received uh, some shocking news today that the the, uh, the coral bleaching in uh, the Great uh, uh, Reef in Australia has been the highest this year. So I think on World Environment Day we have got some very surprising news. Uh, so great, you know I think it's so good to get your perspective on these larger issues. And at the same time, uh, what is very encouraging is that. In such times, there is also a lot of investment happening in a lot of young startups. So in the last few months, you'll be surprised that so many plastic alternative and so many other waste management recycling companies have received uh, a round of funding. So it clearly shows that uh, this is the way forward. Uh, moving on to the first question to Richard. So Richard, this outbreak has impacted the environment in an intriguing way. As CO2 emissions and human mobility have reduced, air quality has improved and wild animals and birds are less fearful to come out and explore the streets. In fact, today morning I shared a picture of uh, Borivali National Park and you couldn't imagine it's the same place. So will the pandemic mark a turning point in how the public views climate change and other environmental concerns? And do you think any new policies will be put in place to encourage 
these positive impacts uh karan thank you uh, i think uh, you're I so right uh, yeah 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 absolutely uh, yes. karan i think uh, the question is really good i think it's very relevant uh, in fact uh, we were discussing earlier not in this group but in another group uh, earlier was how the environment has become so clean and when the environment was dirty we were not wearing masks not that i've got any against masks by the way uh, but mm -hmm. now when the environment is become clean we're all wearing masks when we go out so i think the the important point uh, which i want to put across out here is that this is one opportunity that we have got as um, uh, uh, that we have got where we can act actually now move the needle on the environment part because you got clean air much cleaner air than what you had two months of lockdown almost two months of lockdown nobody on the road or very few vehicles on the road um, less of uh, waste etc being uh, you know generated so i think it created a very different kind of uh, society secondly i think people also realized by sitting at home that this whole idea of minimalist you know which you keep talking about minimalism uh, actually got lived by a lot of people in fact i when i open my cupboard and see my suits and i say okay do i really need them you know and when when i go to ever wear them so today i'm wearing a jacket just because i was coming on this panel otherwise i'm in a t-shirt and jeans <laughs> uh, you know whatever so uh, so i think the 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 entire attitude of consumerism has taken a hit and anjani was talking earlier that Uh, you know wasteful expenditure high consumerism people uh, you know consuming much more than what they need uh, and i think all this has come to a standstill and people are asking themselves that question now the the most important question that you ask can this sustain uh, and again i go back to both the panelists when they said that even much before covid uh, i think environment was a topic of discussion i think the more forward looking companies took it forward i gave you the unilever example there are many more companies there are so many companies in india also which are following good environmental practices so i think this environment thing has remained and also like i said uh, you know like uh, for people who are in uh, and i'm talking of corporate governance now back when corporate governance was not in india i mean clause 49 came in which uh, made it mandatory you saw people move and people got uh, you know premiums for having good governance practices the same thing is going to happen on uh, esg and i can see that going to drive a lot of decisions in boardrooms companies will need to remodel themselves uh, coming out of covid will need completely new business models and if you're going to put out new business models why would you not look at it uh, from a more long term perspective because i think the one lesson that we have learned is that this covid is not one time because covid in different forms is going to come and hit planet earth again and again so business continuity innovation new ways of working being less this thing degradation to the environment ensuring that chemical substances are replaced with natural uses we are going to see restoration of forest uh, i mean i think anjali spoke about restoration of forest so this is going to be a big thing you know you cannot and when you uh, current said that okay animals have come on the road animals have actually come and reclaimed what was theirs yeah. we had taken this away from the animals very true and they came back and said this is ours you know what the hell were you doing on it and uh, so i think uh, uh, reforestation uh, you know giving back to environment what is environment and actually becoming consuming what we actually need and not for our greed and that we want to become rich and also i think more important is going to be the soul divide between the rich and the poor uh, this is going to you're going to see a lot of inclusivity brought in you're going to see a lot of how organizations are going to remodel themselves i have a feeling this is an opportunity for the world it's an opportunity for the corporates the governments and the the uh, civil society to come together and say what are good practices we can put together and how do we actually make this environment much more friendly so that uh, uh, you know all these calamities just i think you spoke about it uh, uh, these um, cyclones and these yes. earthquakes these are also a part of the way we have degraded the environment and uh, a lot of it is got to do with that so i think it's all about giving back and i think uh, uh, i think leaders are now thinking beyond their four walls and uh, this kind of environment that we've been forced into 
makes us also the ability to think beyond. You know, earlier we were very physical in our thinking. We would sit in our office, we would do our meeting there, we would go and meet somebody. Today, you can go and meet anybody in the world. I mean, you just need to be on one call and you can, you, you can do business, you can do various kinds of things. And uh, one can see uh, a very different ways of making payments. You know, this cryptocurrency, I, I just want to mention this cryptocurrency because this is an important point. Uh, uh, when cryptocurrency first came, it was more like a, uh, you know, uh, somebody gambling or trying to make money out of it. But now China was thought of a cryptocurrency which was backed by Central Bank of China. So whether these are going to be the new norms in which, because if everything is going to happen on e-commerce, so settlement also will take place there. So I think we are moving to an age where people are becoming more responsible. And this is an opportunity for leaders to think through some of their strategies as they come through. Because which, whatever you may say, you are not going to come back to the normal before COVID. It is going to be a new normal. And what that new normal is, I don't, none of us can guess. So we will be moving to that and I can see business leaders moving there. So, you know, in fact, surprising, yeah. even, even for us, uh, the kind of conversations we've had with companies has been the most in the last two months where a lot of corporates sure. have actually come forward and started saying that let's have a conversation. Let's try and understand how do we become waste neutral and minimalism yeah. is a new trend. And I think, uh, yeah. I mean, very glad that you highlighted, I think a lot of, uh, Millennials are also following that trend, which is, I think, very good for environment. Yeah. Really questioning that whether you really want to buy something uh, or whether you really, you really need something. So moving on to right. uh, Anjani, do you think mitigating risk remains a non-priority until a disaster strikes? How does the environment risk assessment change for organizations in the light of COVID? No, I, I think uh, environment risk and uh, risk of natural disasters have never been the unknown, unknown ever. You know, look at any risk register of any corporates, you will find this as a line item. What was lacking was about acting on this knowledge. So that was well lacking, largely because maybe uh, the frequency was very different and who knew? I mean, we had the seventh earthquake uh, in northern India near about Delhi this year, last 45 days. So I think it's the only the visible impact, uh, and, you know, uh, are really now feeding to the renewed awareness about risks, and uh, and also elevating the pitch to the level of concern. And we had, I mean, this year we had possibly every possible shock uh, that can happen uh, by nature, and nature always is abundant, but nature has been also uh, able to challenge, humiliate humanity anywhere, anytime uh, <laughs> of its choice. But uh, so, so, so from an assessment perspective, what will change though are a few things, you know. Uh, so there will be better assessment of the impact of any event. I think uh, uh, the world needs to do better than that. There has to be a deeper understanding of really the interconnectivity of the risks and how do, how do they cascade each other? What's the impact, cascading impact of, uh, of the subsequent risks? Uh, they can be triggered by one. So there has to be better understanding. Uh, greater commitment really to build capacity to manage those risks should they occur. I think uh, this COVID also is an example uh, which uh, has exposed humanity's uh, knowledge about uh, managing risks. And probably uh, I think uh, from a corporate perspective, one could really uh, do some pre-designed uh, thematic plans. Of course, they will stay as agile and uh, you know, require the requisite agility and the speed. Uh, for uh, all the phases of a crisis, you know, the surviving phase and then the revival phase. So that's some work to be done. Uh, a lot of work would require to be uh, required around the leadership around uh, a crisis time because you need a very different kind of leadership during a crisis. And most importantly, from a financial world perspective, you know, the investments thus far, we are going to either expand capacity or improve product productivity. But I think we are going to see some investment in building resilience uh, for the future pandemics, uh, and not only pandemics for future crises or political or cultural or demographic nature. So, so there, is a, there is a lot of change that is going to happen around not the risk assessment, but uh, how to manage. Once you have assessed the risk, how do you manage and mitigate, and how do you prepare yourself better? Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, you know to be more resilient going forward, resilient going forward. Yeah. 
my next question is for Sovajoy. And Sovajoy, what a lovely background you have. It is uh, apt for today. Uh, there are solar panels in the wind farm. So let me ask you a question related to that. So, you know, solar energy seemed like a boon when it was introduced. And however, somehow in the race to produce cleaner energy, the last mile problems were overlooked. It is estimated that 78 million tons of PV waste will be generated by 2050. Similarly with electric vehicles, you know, the waste from lithium ion batteries will become a big challenge in the times to come. What are your thoughts on this? Thank you. I think, uh, you know, it's fair to say that uh, last three to four years have really changed the debate on renewable energy. Like, so, since 2015, and I've been working in this sector for a long time. Even in India, if you see that from at some point 17, 18 rupees per kilowatt hour, we're down to two and a half rupees per kilowatt hour. Right? So, and on a non subsidized basis, I think what mm. India has been able to achieve is quite, quite remarkable. And going forward, the renewables, both solar, wind, and who knows, maybe other technologies also in the future, will play a very important role in meeting the, uh, the growing demand. You know, if you see India, the uh, per capita consumption of electricity is very low, still about thousand uh, kilowatt hour per person. Compared to in China, it's three and a half, four thousand kilowatt hour per person. Japan is ten plus thousand kilowatt hour per person. So we have, uh, you know, there's still a lot of headroom in terms of uh, the growth of the uh, consumption. And clearly, this has to renewables have to play a very big role uh, within that. Challenge in renewables, as we know, is only when the sun shines or the wind blows, we have renewable energy. So I think we will see different models emerge in renewables already, some innovative structure like combining renewable with uh, batteries or renewable with hydro, or even in some cases, I think renewable with gas and uh, coal to say that, look, we blend these two. One is uh, somewhat uh, uh, intermittent uh, source, which is uh, solar and wind. And the other is a little bit more predictable, flexible source. And you combine these two, you get uh, what we call dispatchable energy, which is when we need it, how much we need it, we are able to control. Now, uh, that that means that from today, which is 75 to 80 gigawatts of uh, solar plus wind that is installed in India, that will go up to maybe in a 2050 time frame, five to 600 gigawatts. That's a huge, huge uh, jump. So uh, it's a it's an opportunity, but also a risk uh, in terms of there isn't much of a salvage value of a solar plant after five to seven years because the technology is moving so fast. The new uh, equipment, it's like a, a mobile phone, right? A five year old mobile phone has no salvage value and it has to be recycled in a, uh, in a proper possible way. Nobody is going to pay you anything for that uh, mobile phone. So we will see some of this, uh, just like we've seen e-waste uh, coming up. Uh, we will have, they, I'm sure, you know, the I'm, I can talk about India and emerging markets. There are lots of great entrepreneurs and they'll figure out a business model for uh, doing some of this and, uh, you know, uh, figuring out a way to make it economically viable. But we do need those parts of the supply chain to develop, uh, that's for sure. Battery is a little different. So in the sense that uh, lithium, cobalt, nickel, cadmium, manganese, the different uh, uh, materials that go into battery, those can be actually recycled. Absolutely. So even at the end of life, uh, the five to 10 years down the line when the battery cannot be used for electric vehicle purposes, it is possible to recover and recycle uh, those uh, battery materials, which make up about 40% of the cost of the battery. And, you know, things like lithium, there's only a few countries in the world where it is found. So I'm sure there'll be viable business models that will emerge out of that. Now, the right regulations need to be in place so that we have the right incentives. But I think we will see a whole new set of startups and a whole new set of uh, business models commercially viable business models that are going to develop in these areas going forward. But but do you think, is there an oversight or do we miss out on uh, the, the last mile when, when introducing, uh, uh, say, solar panels when they were introduced? So I'll, I'll share uh, an interesting uh, conversation in one of the seminars where uh, companies were presenting on solar, like, you know, how uh, installation should be done and how it can be become, it can be more efficient. But no one spoke about recycling because you know the large solar projects are actually installed in such deserted locations 
I think once the solar panels are absolute waste, to taking it back and then recycling it becomes a big challenge. Do you think in the times to come this will change? That when introducing a, a cleaner source of energy or for, for that matter anything, there will be a more cautious approach that what will happen to the last mile, uh, and a lot of preparation will be done right at the beginning rather than thinking about it later. Yeah, I think so. So if you look at it, most of the capacity in solar in India, the 35 gigawatt or so, most of it has come in the last three to four years. Right, the bulk amount, seven, eight, uh, seven, eight gigawatts per year, come in the last four to five years. And these things have a economic life of 20. This is probably because this is not that big a problem right now, and there isn't a critical mass. That's why they are not thinking about it. At the same time, I think regulations are also going to be tightened. Just like, you know, when at the beginning of the computer boom, there wasn't much of an e-waste uh, uh, industry to think about, right? But as it picked up and the critical mass started developing, the regulations also came in place uh, in order to do that. Even if it is a you know remote location, you always have vehicles which are going there at uh, uh, project sites, etc. So the reverse logistics of it is not something that is a, that is a uh, real challenge. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do agree there need to be the right kind of uh, regulations in place and the right kind of incentives in place, uh, uh, both in terms of incentives and penalties, uh, to make sure that this kind of waste is taken care of and recycled in the most optimal way. So in fact, you know, I'll come back to you on the car recycling policy and the solar recycling policy as we progress. Uh, Richard, uh, the next question is to you. So, you know, tech giants such as Facebook and Google have extended their work from home policy till the end of the year. With some of the world's largest companies making such announcement, it seems likely that many businesses worldwide will follow suit if possible. In a population dense country like India, where the public transportation system in urban cities is usually overburdened, we have now seen a significant drop in the use of public transport, personal vehicles and commercial vehicles. How does this impact the economy and particularly the transportation related sectors? And do you see this changing and having a long term impact? <clears throat> yeah, so we had Google and Facebook announce it globally. Uh, we have TCS announcing it in India that uh, by 2025, I think uh, that only 25% of their staff will actually work from office, 75% will work from home. Uh, and I was talking to somebody in the UK. And the big four accounting firms and some of the large law firms have not de have decided not to go to the office for the next few months. And I'm talking few months means like uh, we don't know whether it's going to be September or December or whatever. So you can see this uh, happening where and one of the law firms, very one of the major law firms, I've been told, is now going to work virtual. They are never going to go back to office again. So this is the reality around the world, and I think more and more people have realized. See, the one very important thing, uh, Karan, that has happened is uh, that people have realized that productivity has improved in the work from home. Mm. Because, you know, when you're sitting in office, you're chit-chatting, you're getting disturbed by different colleagues coming here. Here, if you're doing a presentation, you're working on it. If you've got a task, you're doing it undisturbed. And the productivity has improved. And I think work from home is, becoming, is, is going to become a norm. Secondly, it's taken a lot of stress. It's taken a lot of pollution out of the environment. People don't need to travel to uh, this thing. Secondly, with all this COVID-related issues, people are also a bit scared about going into office environment and will they contract it. So there are multiple issues which are come. But one point I think which I want to put out here, we have to realize that there are some industries which I call the depreciating industries. Uh, when I say depreciating, it is like airlines, automobiles, transportation, uh, hotels. If you don't buy the ticket or if you don't go and book a room, the revenue is lost. So it's depreciating. So on that day, because you know, don't sell a soap today, you can sell it tomorrow. No problem. We can sell 10 soaps tomorrow. But if a room is not sold on one day, if a ticket is not bought, it's gone. Very so sure. there are depreciating industries and these depreciating industries are going to be the most impacted. Now, how are they going to work out? Secondly, we have also seen in public transportation, uh, buses are getting redesigned. Because you can't have the buses full. The buses will work on a particular format. will get filled up in a particular way. So uh, we can see public transportation. Uh, one is going to see your personal transportation getting reduced to a great extent. Even when you're working from office, there is going to be a lot of work. You know, work from anywhere is going to be a norm. It's not work from home exactly. Work from anywhere. Wherever you are, you can sit down and work. 
and and you've accomplished it now. I mean, everybody's accomplished it. You've done meetings. We are doing this webinar today. You know, everybody's in completely different locations. So I think this is going to be the new norm. So I think this is something that we'll have to get dealt with with time. We'll have to see how these industries can ever come back and in what form they will come back. But I'm sure there will be innovation and new ways of what you can do with the same industry. Because the one thing that uh, the current business models have been challenged. You cannot do business in the same way that you did. So even the, this reskilling, upskilling, you know, unlearning, learning, this is going to become the norm of the day. And I think people are going to need to know that, okay, if you have to run a transportation business, now what's the best way to run it? There will be different ways. I'm sure they will emerge. People will think through it and see how one goes. In. But I can tell you, few of these industries are going to be really badly hit for some time at least. And yeah, we correct. hope, yeah, and we hope and pray that not many jobs are lost. Uh, but at the same yeah. time, I'm sure this the city like Mumbai and Bangalore, which is always uh, the traffic issues are so much. I think there could be some benefit out of the new norm. Yes, uh, that absolutely. We are experiencing, uh, Anjani, the sure. next question is for you: is uh, that since the end of World War II, the decline in CO2 emission witnessed in 2020 as a result of COVID-19 will be the largest. This year saw an 8% decline in coal emission, 4.5% from oil, and 2.3% from natural gas. Emissions declined the most in regions which were impacted the highest by the disease. However, does this sharp pandemic-related decline indicate that it is, in fact, possible to reduce emissions at a much faster ba uh, rate based on what we have learned about energy consumption during this period? Suddenly, it, it seems... Looks um, like yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying it somewhere it looks achievable. Um, yes, of course, uh, it's not surprising that we, the emissions were reduced. But uh, did we flatten the curve, uh, emission curve? Probably yes, for a few days, few weeks. But uh, we don't want to flatten the curve like this by shutting down everything, right? So there has to be a more structured way. Uh, I am very hopeful. But there is a lot of pain going ahead, you know, in terms of uh, being able to change the really the energy equation. And I think Sujoy, uh, uh, Superjoy uh, did talk about uh, solar and many of such initiatives. But I think, uh, you know, most of the activity, I mean, there are supply side and then there are demand side, largely supply side. I think uh, the challenge is that uh, we have huge uh, capital invested in the fossil fuel generation uh, capacities around the world. Uh, there was a recent report by Carbon Tracker, uh, which says that it's as, as early as as late as a couple of months back, I think, uh, to say that uh, look, 40 to 60 percent of the of the coal capacity, uh, coal uh, power generation capacity in the EU and in China uh, is not generating any cash. Is is loss making. Uh, the in entire uh, uh, you know uh, Southeast Asia, uh, which is relevant to us, the solar uh, uh, the renewable energy power cost is lower than the coal generation cost. So we are talking about large amounts of uh, you know capacity, and and unfortunately, uh, uh, you know there is again some study by the same organization which says that uh, you know the capacity that is uh, under execution and plan amounts to some $600 billion of investment now. So the question is, why is the world setting up these capacities which doesn't make sense? Even the older uh, generation capacity has to be mothballed uh, and uh, you know shut down earlier to their normally, usually, let's say, 40 years of life. So there has to be uh, uh, some just transition of, of capacities. Now, COVID, interestingly and unfortunately for the fossil fuel industry has really triggered a, a fast forward action on this. It has hastened the process of the peak demand uh, in terms of oil, gas and, and coal, uh, so to speak. And there are studies a 2% fall, annual fall in, in, the, in the fossil fuel demand could impact the, this industry by $25 trillion. So yes, there is a huge amount capital invested. There has to be a just transition because there are, we are talking about 
capital impact on this industry, the consumers, the financial industry. Uh, I, you know, for example, this industry uh, almost uh, is, uh, by some uh, estimates, is 25% of the capital market value. So you can't make all the changes in a day. It has to be a just transition. So, but then we are hopeful, given the immense interest uh, shown by largely private sector and uh, everybody else in the world other than the uh, fossil fuel <laughs> surplus countries. Fortunately, India is not one of them. So we hopefully will see better times. We're already seeing immense capacity addition, a big move towards solar. And uh, India has, in fact, uh, has a leadership position in that. So good times ahead, fortunately. Thank you. Great. Uh, so Vajoy, since Anjani mentioned about oil, uh, what does negative oil really mean and how are businesses coping with this situation? <laughs> it's interesting. So if you see roughly about, you know, daily demand for oil around the world is about 100 million barrels. Okay, so give or take, uh, 95 to 100 million uh, barrels. And even a small swing in this uh, scenario, maybe three, four, five million barrel swing in demand, reduction in demand, can re result in a huge down swing in the price of oil, in, which is kind of what we are seeing today. So Brent crude is down to the 30, 30 dollar type of levels. Uh, just by comparison, when we saw the global financial crisis in uh, 2010 uh, and so on, there was a reduction in the demand. Uh, it was around the three to four billion barrels per day. Already in middle of COVID, we have seen a 10 to 12 million barrel per day uh, reduction. Yeah. Now, of course, as lockdowns get lifted and things come up, uh, some of that will recover. But as Richard was saying, there are certain activities like transportation and aviation, which will structurally go down in activity. So we will settle at a lower level. of. Uh, so I think, of course, I will not make any prediction on the price of oil going forward. But the general expectation is that they will remain depressed. In that. And that has obviously a couple of, uh, couple of implications. Uh, gas, for example, you know, it's down to $2 per MMBTU. The uh, liquefied natural gas is $2 per MMBTU. And already we see that in some markets, like in Europe, uh, the business case for new renewables is becoming weaker because, you know, gas, there's already power plants which are there running on gas and with so much lower gas, the new uh, investment in renewable the business case is becoming weaker. So I agree the longer term trends are there, but short term there will be some of these distortions that can also happen. Now this negative price of oil, as we all saw what happened in uh, in the US, uh, I think this is to do, I won't go into the detail of it, but this is largely to do with the the, the financial, the, you know, the, the cost of a future barrel of oil. And you know, given that uh, expected fall in the uh, price of oil uh, and all the uh, storage that is available gets filled up. Now, people who have uh, bought, let's say, a barrel of oil in April or March with an expected delivery in May, and they have locked it in at a certain price. Now, storage is full. You cannot store that oil anymore, but you still have to go through with that contract. And that kind of created that peculiar uh, uh, syndrome of negative uh, uh, price. That means people were willing to pay someone to not uh, not go through with their contract of uh, buying oil. So I think that in the financial world or the paper world, we will see some of those peculiarities uh, coming up. We've never seen that before. In, in physical terms, I think we are still in for, at least in the near term, uh, depressed uh, fossil fuel prices. Uh, which in a way, you know, the other impact of low fossil fuel prices is very little investment goes in. At $180 to $100, $120 a barrel of oil, there's a lot of investment that goes into upstream exploration and production of oil. And at $20, $30, most of those projects are not economically viable anymore. Now that money needs to be invested somewhere else. And you know, it's hopefully it will go to more cleaner uh, solutions and cleaner infra green infrastructure. Uh, that's at least what we are seeing that that money is uh, coming up. So that's like a two way, uh, two way thing. The lower fossil fuel price indicates that uh, demand is continuing to be low, but it also indicates that that 
huge amounts of uh, you know tens of billions of uh, sometimes hundreds of billions of dollars that are invested in the fossil fuel industry has to find a home somewhere else uh, and uh, sure. has to come towards cleaner technologies in fact i was wondering that if you were to actually predict the oil prices the participation in this <laughs> webinar would just shoot up like anything <laughs> and and as you are aware that we are also streaming live on facebook i'm sure the viewership there would uh, go up uh, it would become a sensational news at mckinsey partner predicting oil prices <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe maybe towards the end we'll try uh, so you know uh, coming to richard richard we just spoke about the entire life cycle of solar panel and in yeah. my discussion with you we were discussing yeah. about uh, the same issue do you think sure. going forward economies and companies will become more circular and this will change in fact as we speak there is also news uh, and mr gadkari did come out and say that a car recycling policy uh, will also be implemented soon and uh, I, for us as a recycling company we are also expecting it but do you think this crisis has also given an impetus to that <clears throat> i don't think there could be i think uh, karan you are absolutely right i think this is the salient features of covid have actually moving the economy to a circular economy i think it's pushing everything in that direction of saying that okay uh, how do you uh, you know if you buy something how do you use it with care and then how do you repair it how do you reuse it and how do you send it back and uh, so i can see that happening on a large scale basis uh, across companies and uh, um, uh, the, see the two three things okay before getting into that i think what this crisis is exposed to three things one is inequality we have spoken it about it but oh. it is intrinsic inequality that is there climate breakdown that has happened and of course the inherent fragility in the entire supply chain system this entire thing we spoke about linear um, i think so joy spoke about the linear thing that has been now challenged as to whether that's the right way to do it or any other better way to do it and i think the i think instead of just saying circular i would say now uh, companies need to be circular in every aspect of their business in every aspect of their business they should make it easier for customers to acquire cars for and pass on the products uh, in circular ways such as repairing reusing reselling their product and make the whole economy 100% from the beginning from the moment you buy it, it you know that it's going to go and there are examples like there's a company called terra cycle which actually offers a circular packaging so they have a very nice packaging they package your product you uh, give it back to them they will clean it and they will reuse that same packaging again because it's a high quality packaging so you can see packaging also improving uh, quite a lot and used Uh, Adidas in UK, they have come up with incentive scheme. You bring back the old products. It is not about just giving it back. We will give you points, or we will give you gift cards or something. So they are incentivizing people. IKEA. I mean, I'm just going to give IKEA as a global company, but I'm giving an India example. What did they do in North India? People who live in North realize that during winters, this whole rice, you know, the rice waste burning in Punjab uh, creates a huge amount of environment issues in Delhi and surrounding areas. so what ikea has done is they have uh, committed to buy the entire waste the rice waste and convert them into uh, baskets rugs bowls and uh, so so and also given the uh, farmers now that because the farmers are asking for more support price because they needed to get rid of this waste now they saying we are going to buy it out from you so uh, so i think uh, this has created so so this is a very near home example to show that how do you can actually create a circular economy companies can come with very innovative this was not their business they were never doing rice waste but they have got into it in india and now i'm sure they will take it and export it to other parts of their globe wherever ikea is functioning so india is going to be the kind of this thing secondly i think as you know in your business that there is money to be made <laughs> so it's not only that you recycle but there is also money to be made so that's a good news and i think people need to know um ikea another example of ikea is where they turn plastic waste into beautiful textiles i'm not getting into more details but i don't want to take up too much time unilever has worked on a lot of water smart solutions coming out where the water quality is not good or there is no water they have come with solutions which require less water um, and uh, they have got so i think a lot of companies are coming out with their own kind of solutions and i think the circular economy is here to stay in fact it is going to get a big it's got its biggest impetus 
and I think it's going to uh, become a good business model because everybody in the value chain is going to make money. So it's just it's not about making money, but there is a financial reward also if you uh, do it. In fact, you know, uh, thank you, Richard, for sharing such uh, interesting examples. IKEA is definitely one company which has uh, done so much with the countries and you know social groups and really proven that you know to become a successful brand, if you really go that extra mile, uh, then then it creates a fantastic win-win situation. In fact, even in electronics, like you know, uh, we started as an e-waste recycling company. Uh, to some level, circularity is achieved by an extended producer responsibility, whereas a brand you need to take ownership to ensure that once you have generated X amount of e-waste in the country, a percentage of that needs to come back and be recycled. So fantastic. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Karan, yes, I would sorry. just like to share one more example. Karan, yes. I would just like to share one yes. more example here. There is a company in Hyderabad called Maitri. It's an Indian company, purely Indian company. They have with the Institute of Science developed a, a product where they pull water out of air. They take the air yes. and they are able to produce clean drinking water. Now, this uh, they don't go for ground level water. So this is going to solve a huge problem once it gets onto scale. Uh, they are already commercial. They are already selling their machines, and they are making large machines. They are even making very large installations for you know larger applications. Uh, the only challenge they have, and I think somebody will need to give an answer on that. They use power. So they need alternate energy or something that could actually support them to bring that cost down. But otherwise, they are cheaper than the normal drinking water. And they take out clean drinking water. There is no plastic. There is nothing in this. And uh, it is no groundwater. So this is another innovation I want to say from a uh, sustainability perspective where somebody, and this is a purely Indian company, which has done it and uh, put it here. Great. Yeah, Karan, thank you. Yes, uh, Anjali, you have been running a successful sustainability sustainable advisory firm. How is sustainability relevant to business? And from a leadership perspective, what are the conversations with regards to sustainability that are going on with the teams in the boardroom? And are these conversations only short-term related or long-term ones? Lovely question. I can go on and all, but I'll be brief. So let me take the, the question in two parts. What's uh, first relevance of sustainability? So, uh, uh, you know, sustainability is, is like, a, like a bridge between, um, a natural bridge though, between capitalism and democracy. Uh, and, uh, so I, and because no business really can flourish in a failed society or a flawed society or, and or a perishing ecosystem. So business is uh, part of this. And hence, uh, business continues to uh, to need to you know really defining its playing field, resets its value proposition, redesign, coming up with what's the product and services it needs to produce to stay relevant. It's the it's the business must hold themselves accountable to really the collective wisdom and expression of the. Everybody in the world who has expressed, who have expressed collectively the desire to meet sustainable development goals, uh, the UN goals that you do, and I'm, I'm sure most of people are aware of. And hence, it has a material interest in making sure that it creates or shapes a viable long-term operating environment, which it can leverage to make some profit and feed it into our stakeholders. Now, financial markets love uh, sustainability because they don't want to be uh, exposed to sudden risks like this. And from a value perspective, there is a lot of value in these values. So, uh, you know, the S&P has said that 84% of the market value is intangible. And it is only through the sustainable development goals uh, or factors that you could really help uh, unravel the intangibles and value of intangibles. So that, so sustainability is fair and square, um, absolutely uh, meaningful and relevant to business. And there is a lot of opportunities also. For example, uh, you know, numbers could differ, but the low carbon economy itself alone is supposed to be $20, $25 trillion of opportunity. So it makes great sense for business. Let me turn into the board question. So, uh, yes, I mean, uh, for a couple of months now, the, 
the focus of the board has been um, uh, really uh, sort of uh, the lens is narrowed on two 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 parts of uh, two, two 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 discussions. One is on business continuity, um, uh, which you know in large part means uh, you know assets and more importantly cash. So the, uh, the the CEO and the board discussions have been around it, and more importantly, I think everybody, each board has been uh, focusing on what's happening to its people. And uh, trust me, the CEOs have taken upon responsibilities of being the healthcare uh, leaders for their organizations for healthcare and well-being of the people. So. So this, these two, uh, you know, this is like a narrow focus for last two three months. But I think as and when uh, uh, the, the 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 after the of course the annual results season is over, and the survival phase uh, uh, is is passes through, uh, there will be greater focus on again on on a long range discussion. So let me share a few discussions that are already happening in boards that, uh, that I'm related to or that uh, we are working with. Uh, one is around the purpose, you know, what's the purpose? How do you shape the value proposition? How do you re really redefine the playing field, etc.? The other uh, discussions are around, around, around system thinking, you know, what is the multi-stakeholder partnership? How do you collaborate more with external work? where you want to compete, where you want to collaborate, how do you leverage the whole ecosystem for, for doing what you're trying to do. Around carbon and environment, I think uh, uh, discussions have started around what could be really the just transition so that the disruptions are minimized and uh, for, for the company. Uh, on the CSR side, uh, the discussion is transitioning from spend amount to really what is the impact being created. Uh, so a lot of data, impact centric data is uh, expected to be uh, data available, pulled through uh, the organization's uh, you know, basis. Um, in terms of, uh, and actually, frankly, uh, sustainability is going to hit all parts of business, you know, around uh, Financing, and, uh, investments around regulations, ownerships, uh, governance, and accountability, and performance measurement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I think uh, 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 it has not yet uh, maybe hit uh, most boards yet, but I think soon enough we will be discussing how do you balance the competing needs of all stakeholders. Uh, and and the discussion would be around: Are they really competing? Are they conflicting? Hopefully not. Uh, there is a belief that at times they may be conflicting, but I think if you dig deeper, uh, uh, I think uh, most businesses will be convinced that they are not, they're complementary, they are not conflicting, but they could be competing for resources and attention. And how do at the, at the board level, CXL level, there will be discussions around this. Um, uh, I think uh, by and large, everybody has realized the shareholder supremacy uh, or shareholders, the, the board catering to only the shareholders. I think uh, that era is sort of uh, uh, passing by to say, okay, uh, yes, it is shareholders return, but uh, the long-term reward of shareholders is can only be secured uh, by taking care of people, community and customers and partners and everybody. So that's the transition with, in the boardroom that is going to happen. And a focus uh, on multi-capitals, Beyond only the financial capital, how do the other capitals uh, interact with each other? How do we leverage them to for, for multi-stakeholder benefit? That's the discussion. So, in fact, I'll come back to you. On, on, but yes, I'm you. sure you everybody you're passionate about your work, and I'm sure you can <laughs> continue. But I'll come back to you on the the, the shareholder view. Uh, before that, uh, let me go to Sovajoy and ask him that how can company goals and investments match the level of action suggested by climate science, and how can businesses deliver clear messages to government to develop strong policies for mitigating climate change. So Sohaja, you are a climate change expert. we will be very glad to get your view on this. So I think coming out of COVID, one thing is for sure that in every major economy around the world, government is going to play an important role. And when in, even in India, we have seen the large stimulus package, US, we've seen stimulus package, 
Europe is a great example where uh, it was mentioned earlier, the Green New Deal, where 750 billion euro package is being uh, given out. Now the question is, in return for that, those kinds of stimulus packages, what is the direction that these governments are going to set? What are the kinds of investments that they're going to uh, uh, incentivize? Obviously there is from uh, you know, job creation, livelihoods, uh, uh, creating uh, disposable income, uh, spurring demand. I think those are near to medium term. Those are important uh, goals. Uh, but I think it's also important to say that oh, this uh, investment and the stimulus is going to be uh, used as a way of creating a set of assets for the future. Right. So, uh, I'll give you an example. In India, for example, if uh, you know uh, in the power sector or in other sector where the government has stepped in in power sector the government has given uh, uh, announced a 90000 crore liquidity package etc so hopefully you know eventually that's going to result in investments uh, further investments in renewables and in other areas now what where do, where do those investments go it's important to set some direction uh, uh, within that and also from a you know i talked about the climate risk earlier that some of these investments we have to show that they you know demonstrate that it's taking the climate change thinking into account. So it was a great discussion we had with some folks in the government in India about two or three months ago before uh, COVID. And we were talking about this climate risk and uh, in the context of affordable housing. To say that, look, and when we talk about affordable housing, the focus is how do, how do we reduce the cost of the housing and where do we find the land? And that's the kind of discussion. But we don't always take into account the future climate impact on affordable housing. Are we citing them at the right places? Is this affordable housing being created with the kind of the right level of resilience as far as the construction practices and material and standards and safety codes, et cetera, is concerned? So, or we are building, say, coastal highways or uh, infrastructure uh, where we are expecting, you know, higher cyclones and uh, more kind of uh, uh, precipitation are we building that in into you know infrastructure that's going to be there for 40 to 50 years? So that is one element where I think where is this uh, investment and stimulus going to be directed towards? Which uh, what principles are we going to base it on? Uh, if we are making investments for the next 30 to 50 years, how are we building in the fact that yes, I mean of course it will be great if we are able to mitigate it and come back to a like a 1.5 degree pathway or uh, something like that. But we have to plan for the worst uh, in, in this case, because that's at least in a business as usual or even in a realistic scenario, uh, these risks are going to get more and more, uh, more and more uh, accentuated. Now, coming back to the company's uh, perspective, just to build on what Anjani said earlier as well, that uh, many companies are also saying that look, individually, we may not be able to do a lot, but can we at a... Um, at a ecosystem level or at a industry level or at a sector level, can we get together? And if there are risks that collectively we can uh, mitigate uh, and then go to the government and say that, look, these are the kind of supporting enabling uh, uh, policies and regulations that we need uh, in order to do that. So I think this role of government going forward is going to be important, but it's a, it's a two way, uh, two way role uh, that it's, Government will set some direction, but also it's for different sectors uh, to come up, especially the ones that have been hit very hard, like aviation and hospitality, etc. They will ask for it, ask for certain uh, special uh, packages, etc. Uh, but areas where there is a much more direct impact on uh, climate change, and there are sectors like steel and cement, where those are quite difficult to the carbon abatement in those sectors is quite difficult uh, to do right and uh, is there a way to incentivize the accelerate the adoption of technologies which can reduce the carbon intensity of some of those uh, because you know those industries are not going to go away in a growing economy those are not going to go away but as we are investing and as we are giving some incentives into that can we also encourage and incentivize the adoption of uh, those technologies I think those are some areas uh, which uh, will come. Um, we already talked about some of the other areas like electric mobility and uh, right. energy. Those are more, more kind of obvious uh, areas. 
so you know in fact uh, there was a very interesting piece of information that i came across some time back that how the top 5 companies put together are uh, are almost equal to india's gdp how the top 50 companies put together in the world are richer than 160 countries combined in the world so this clearly shows that there is some sort of inequality and there is imbalance because i mean to my mind i always felt that companies would destroy natural resources and after earning enough profit a very small part was spent towards environmental causes which they call csr do you see this shifts changing where companies will clearly look at a greener approach keeping in mind and knowing that this uh, this may not be very profitable but this is the right approach because this clearly is an imbalance like anjani spoke about stakeholders and not shareholders so i would be very glad to get all three of your thoughts on this so yeah maybe i can start oh, sorry go ahead no go ahead go ahead subhash so no, i i thank you i think uh, the pressure comes from three three different directions right one is the core economics of it right in many cases you know, renewables is a great example as we said from 17 rupees down to 2 rupees 50 paisa it's at parity grid parity when it's available so the many of these technologies with the right kind of scaling up the economics change so at the early stage it is important to give certain incentives and uh, give certain uh, support but you know on a non subsidized basis the economics change so in india large companies are seeking out renewable energy not because it's not just because it's the right thing to do but it makes makes sense also second is the capital markets where it's very clear that there is a you know large source large pockets of capital which are looking for deployment into you know whether you call it esg or green finance or whatever name we give it but they uh, the people who are deploying that capital want to have certain guarantees and safeguards that it is going into creating assets uh, in in a way which is environmentally sustainable and there's already on the esg front you know many companies uh, you know there are just like your credit rating agencies you have esg rating agencies also so based on the practices and the policies and the assets of a company you get a certain esg rating and that esg rating if you are raising you know green bonds or raising money from esg investors you have to show that where you are on those esg ratings so that's already said an early stage but i think that's a great way to say that look more transparency is going to be created this is not about green wash anymore and finally i mentioned earlier around the consumer and the customer uh, voice speaks and people vote with their wallets and that i think those three things the economics the capital markets and the consumer those are the three uh, you know kind of triple force which will make sure that you know different different companies different sectors will move at different speeds but those are the three when when they start converging the force will become quite uh, quite compelling richard anjani your thoughts on this <clears throat> okay uh... so i uh, i look at it like this um, for example there was a conference board survey which said that uh, consumers were not aware uh, were not aware of what these brands were doing and there was not enough communication you see i I'll, i'll give you uh, an example in india if people hear the amul story uh, which i have heard and i was telling the managing director that if you tell this story to every indian i think every indian will only buy amul products i mean that story is so uh, uh, because it is one place where you reward the farmers at the highest return and uh, you know and give the product at the cheapest price to the consumer so i mean both uh, how do you work the balance between these two uh, so similarly i think you know uh, consumers need to know about uh, the working conditions about how the uh, labor is being paid you know all this and then people buy those kind of brands so i think people will move and especially the new society the younger generation they are very uh, this thing by the sustainability by working conditions by quality and by this inequities which have been built they don't like it and uh, so if consumer brands can actually communicate this message in a much powerful way i think it will help i think commitment starts at the top unilever is a great example where paul pullman stuck his neck out and did what he did for his company today he is the largest voice on sustainability 
from the corporate world though he's retired i think you need uh, uh, you need uh, uh, ex external advisory councils you need this to be uh, board committee to be put you know you have various board committees there will have to be one committee on sustainability which will have to look to see how do you actually make yourself much more sustainable and you know uh, because like i said in every business in the initial period uh, there could be uh, challenges about not making the money but over a period of time see we are not running a sprint here we are running a marathon if a company is here for the long term and it's not here to make the quick buck i think they will benefit over the long term so i think once this attitude is built into the mind of the owner or the person who is running the business i think we have got a clear answer on that so uh, since you mentioned amul uh, i would just uh, add one thing before i ask anjani the same question is uh, i had the good fortune to visit anand and meet dr vagish kurian personally when i was oh, in college and uh, one of us asked him that you know what are the three mantras of success and quick came the reply integrity integrity and integrity and i think i agree that a business driven by purpose and transparency yeah. can can surpass years to come anjani the same question to you would be very glad to have your thoughts yeah i'll just supplement uh, uh, what subhajay and richard already mentioned i think uh, for for uh, to to be able to achieve uh, a fundamental uh, success on these matters you need collaboration cooperation between all the three constituents you know your the government and the business and the civil society i think on matters of uh, environment uh, the big boys while they have may have been the biggest polluters but but big boys are now good news is they are taking lead and uh, be it uh, the 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 uh, net zero movement uh, be it science based targets taken up by 870 companies be it the women business the women business for example 1100 largest companies are uh, committed and they are pushing uh, the governments who are dithering on this to say we shall follow a uh, very strict and stringent uh, uh, climate change path fortunately the same alliance is saying now the stimulus package and apparently on a lighter when um, uh, maybe in some jurisdictions uh, they are they are spraying money on a lighter vein but uh, this alliance has come back and said look you know the stimulus package should be directed towards electric electric vehicles uh, grid infrastructure uh energy storage uh, renewable energy support just to make sure that we have a just recovery and a decarbonization of the industry because these amounts of support from any governments or all governments around the world is not going to happen unless there is another covid too so so everybody the big business realizes that this is their opportunity uh, to 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 be able to galvanize some of these uh, towards uh, a just transition uh only thing we would request the government is not to hold hands from behind but to hold hands from from the front to be able to support these initiatives and then we will get there i think we have some of the brightest minds uh globally and the big boys of the business uh, working towards it fantastic so uh, you know i have close to a combined experience base of 100 years in the three of you i think it was <laughs> uh, we should have actually kept this session over a few days and not over few few hours or few minutes uh, because i can i am just seeing the clock now i got so in uh, engrossed in the entire conversation so i think we can actually only have one last question and unfortunately not take any questions from the audiences but what we'll try to do is connect you with our audiences in some way our attendees or participants let they get a chance because some of their suggestions their questions can be very inspiring what we have experience and i see some very distinguished people also as a part of our uh, participant group together but one question is what would be your uh, what is your advice to leaders to navigate through the through covid 19 your your suggestion to leaders I as they navigate maybe a few yes. moments uh, so so i think uh, it's a moment uh, to rethink <laughs> uh that's what we will uh, request the leaders and rebuild better you know if you are rebuilding you need to rebuild better um second is uh, the whole attitude to what is really you know what do we value most and work towards it 
um, I would just remind them that look, you know, if you if you're you know maybe in 2030 when you look back, uh, you should be able to uh, proudly answer the question. Okay, so what did you do in the COVID war? Uh, so you know, so that's the question the leaders of today should be able to answer. Uh, and and this is a great opportunity to really uh, build uh, uh, what you call a bank of trust. Uh, so, so I take a pause here. These are the three, four things that I would like to request the leaders to focus on. So, what are Richard? Okay, uh, I'll go then. Uh, <clears throat> I think the first thing that I will tell the leaders be human first. I think uh, this is the time everybody's going through a crisis. People are worried about their jobs. People are worried about uh, this thing. So be human first. I think Anjani did mention it earlier about, and also I would say this is the test of the character of leadership. He said now that later, 10 years later, when you look back on this and you want to see how you did, I think your character, how you dealt with the situation is going to come to the fore. So I think uh, the brand has never been tested so much as it's now. I think your brand, the whole trust factor around it is very important. Uh, the cash, uh, you know, the, the one thing which is now found that in this post-COVID era, the people who have cash will survive. And the people who have spent their cash will have challenges because they will have difficulty in having money to carry on the businesses. So I think the, the, the point uh, which uh, one would look at, how do you improve employee engagement? Uh, alliances, the one other advice, the alliances. I mean, getting into... To give you a small example, um, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and Colgate came together on this plastic recycling, right, for their uh, products. Oh. And they have opened it up to everybody. They said, whatever research we do here, anybody can use it. And this was pre-COVID, by the way. But post-COVID, you're going to see some alliances between competitors, which you never had them as alliance partners. So alliances are going to look at very, very differently. So people should be open to it. People should be open their mind. They need to reimagine cost. So you cannot say that this is, you know, look at cost cutting, but you have to reimagine cost completely. Oh. Because let's see the factor that you have lost a huge amount of revenue. How are you going to now take forward the company in these periods? And it is for the leadership, the last suggestion I would leave, don't be reactive. Take a pause, think about it, and then respond to the situation. Now that's my <coughs> So collaboration is a way forward. Yeah. Yes. So, Joy? Yeah. No, I think these are great points. I would say that first and foremost, COVID is a humanitarian crisis. So you know, we, we talked about obviously the second order impact on the economies and various things, but we have to bear in mind. This is a humanitarian crisis on many levels. People who have suffered from the disease as well as you know, in uh, reality, many companies will be forced to take some very tough decisions around laying off people, shutting down businesses and so on, right? So there's a humanitarian angle to this. And the real test of leadership here is how in a, an empathetic and compassionate way, some of those tough decisions, uh, you know, those are inevitable. They have to be navigated. But can you do it in an empath empathetic and uh, compassionate way? And the other uh, part is how can you reimagine the future? And this is not just one or two years out, but five, 10, 15 years out. Many different aspects uh, will come into that. Uh, the, the new normal, whatever that is going to be, uh, that's going to come in. Climate uh, change is going to come in. New technologies are going to come in. So the real visionary leaders today are thinking, you know, how am I going to win over the next 10 to 15 years? So the doors of five year strategies are gone, but I'm thinking, Next 10 to 15 years, what are the big disruptive trends? And you cannot build a long-term strategy, but how do you create nimbleness and entrepreneurship within the organization to manage the risks and uh, build for the future? Okay, great. And like I said, you know, we can actually keep going on. Before uh, I say thank you to all of you, I would like to ask one last question. What is the first thing that you do post the lockdown? What is it that you have missed doing the most? <laughs> I can go? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I love the lockdown in a way. God has been kind, so all secured in a good environment and fortunate, uh, lucky lucky people. So, But then what I miss is two couple of things I miss. Um, one is the ability to interact with uh, 
really the millennial, millennial colleagues uh, were really bright, were really uh, intelligent, uh, and, and a lot more ethical than probably I was. Uh, I must say, I must recognize. And also, uh, while we call, we know, the webinars are great uh, learning and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I really miss the, uh, the confluence of people where you could interact with on a multi, multi platform, you know, one to many, because uh, otherwise, you know, platforms like this, four of us have been speaking and uh, we have not been able to learn from the, from the audience. So I miss that. Uh, but other than that, I think a uh, great learning, um, you know, I have sharpened my skills and skills to learn as well, etc. So no, no complaints. Fantastic. Thank you. So what do I, Richard? Yeah. So from my side, I think, uh, you know, I'm uh, one of my hobbies and passions is cycling. So as the uh, lockdown was lifted, the first thing I did was to go out for a cycle ride outside. Wow. I have a stationary bike at home, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, and the first few days after the lockdown started getting lifted, the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. relaxation in Delhi, the weather was fantastic. The air was clean. The roads were empty. So I really enjoyed that. Super. Richard? So, uh, so for me, it is exactly what Anjani said. It's about interacting with people. I love people. And I'm not sure we'll ever be able to get back to the old way of interacting, but uh, oh. uh, the quicker, because they're social animals. Humans are social animals. And one learns from every interaction. And the more we meet people, the more we learn. Uh, I think that is something that is being missed. Uh, the ability to go to restaurants, the ability to go out, uh, the ability to do some of those things, uh, and also to take part in some sporting activities, you know, whatever it may be, would be something that uh, one would love to get back to as soon as possible. Great. And I think, uh, like Anjani mentioned, the fact that uh, we are uh, home and safe, I think, is uh, also a big blessing. And I do definitely miss sports, but but yes, can't complain. So my, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you for taking time out, you know, to interact with, uh, to have this discussion on sustainability. It was very interesting for me and I'm sure everybody who's joined today, it was wonderful for all of them. I can see there are so many questions, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Uh, we will definitely uh, try to connect you and all our participants today to see that, you know, how can this interaction be taken forward? Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Bye. Thanks, Bye. The panelists. And all the best. Bye-bye. All the best, Karan. Thank, thank you, everyone. You.